Hello all, this is Dr. Alsup, and this will be our only video regarding the musculoskeletal anatomy of the abdomen. And the focus of this will be primarily muscles, and we will talk about why that is um, in a bit more detail. But we are going to start our discussion with the diaphragm, which is kind of in between uh, the abdomen and the, the thorax, and we'll talk a little bit about what that where that is and what that does. Then we're going to get into the muscles of the abdominal wall. So we'll have anterior lateral muscles. We'll also have the rectus abdominis, which is a bit more um, anterior, anteriorly placed. So the abdomen is part of the trunk, and you can see the abdominal cavity right here. It's part of the trunk that is between the thorax, which is up in this region, and the uh, and the um, pelvis, all right? And it's anterior lateral uh, musculoaponeurotic walls, so we'll mainly be talking about the, the muscles, um, are going to be suspended by these bony rings, so from that thoracic cage region and the pelvic girdle region, and we'll have muscles attaching to these areas and covering the, particularly the anterior portion of the abdominal wall, because, and this is a very important point, we do not have bones when we are talking about the anterior portion of the abdomen. We just have muscles. We have some fairly thick aponeuroses, and the way that the muscles are organized in terms of how their fibers run and those tendons will really help to kind of make up for the fact that there are no bones anteriorly. But that is something unique to this area, and you can kind of palpate. You can palpate the anterior portion of your abdomen, and you don't feel any bones there. You do have bones posteriorly. Think about what would those bones be? Those are going to be mostly those lumbar vertebrae. You may get into a little of the thoracic region, um, but you do have parts of the vertebral column that will be associated with the abdomen. But since we talked about those bones when we talked about the back, um, we are not getting into any bones when talking about the abdomen. Okay, so starting with the diaphragm, and as I mentioned, you can put the diaphragm and discuss it with the abdomen, or you could even discuss it with the thoracic cavity as well, because the diaphragm is a shared wall. It's either the floor or the ceiling separating the thoracic and the abdominal cavities. And you can see that kind of right here. You see it extending up into this thoracic cage, but it can also move into the abdominal region as well. So really plays a role in terms of separating those cavities. Anything superior would be part of the thoracic cavity. Anything inferior would be part of the abdominal cavity. And you've likely heard of the diaphragm. You think about if you really want to um, sing loudly, you would sing or you'd project from your diaphragm because this is the chief muscle of inspiration. And really, it's the chief muscle of respiration because expiration or exhalation is largely passive. And the levels of the domes of the diaphragm, because the diaphragm is kind of shaped like this. You'll have a central tendon in this middle region and then two domes on either side. Um, the levels of those domes will vary. They'll either go higher or lower uh, according to a few things. First, the phase of respiration. So you can kind of see um, where, how far it'll project up into the thoracic cavity um, or how it will go uh, closer to the abdominal cavity. The diaphragm will also, uh, how it is shaped and where it is located is dependent on uh, your posture. So if you are supine or lying down, that would look different than if you were standing. And also, very importantly, the size and distension of all those abdominal viscera, particularly the more superior portions, that could project up into the diaphragm and push the diaphragm up superiorly. The diaphragm is innervated by the phrenic nerve, and the phrenic nerve is going to um, be derived from the cervical spinal nerve C3, 4, and 5, and there's a lovely little ditty that one can say, C3, 4, and 5, keep the diaphragm alive, and that is indicating which spinal nerve levels the fibers kind of coalesce to form the phrenic nerve, and that is what will innervate the diaphragm. 
There are three openings in the diaphragm, and that's really important to note because if it is truly kind of completely separating that thoracic region from the abdominal region, you're going to have structures that need to kind of go through both of those spaces. So you'll have these small openings in the diaphragm to allow for those structures to move through. And so there's three main openings that I want you to know about. The first is what's referred to as the caval opening. And what will um, traverse this region is what's called the inferior vena cava, or the IVC. And this is going to allow drainage of mostly deoxygenated blood from the lower portion of the body into the right atrium of the heart. So you are getting this uh, essentially a very large vein that will be moving towards the heart and draining that lower portion of the body. Next, you will have an esophageal hiatus, which is, as its name would suggest, allows for the esophagus to traverse this region. So you'll have the esophagus associated with the very deep or posterior portion of the thorax. It will traverse the diaphragm and then it will transition once you get into the abdominal cavity into the stomach region. Sometimes you can have portions of the stomach um, that will herniate up through this esophageal hiatus um, into the thoracic cavity region. Also importantly, next to on either side of the esophagus, you'll have the two vagus nerves that will traverse this hiatus. So the vagus nerve, as you can see here, is a cranial nerve. So it originates all the way up in the brain. And then it will travel all the way to the abdomen because it's going to be very important in terms of the parasympathetic supply of many ab of the abdominal organs. So you have the vagus nerves traversing that region as well. Lastly, you will have the aortic hiatus which will allow the aorta to traverse this region, so the descending aorta, so the portion that is going down to the lower limb to supply um, those portion, that portion of the body. Also, and you can't see it here, you will have the thoracic duct that will uh, ascend through this hiatus um, in order to uh, get up to where it eventually will drain in the venous angle, and you'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, in your lymphatics lecture because the thoracic duct is one of the major vessels of the lymphatic system. So a really important structure, um, kind of a TBD, you will come back to thoracic duct in considerable more detail. Okay, so that is the diaphragm. Diaphragm, like I said, is kind of that in-between muscle. You can consider it part of the thoracic cavity. You can consider it part of the abdominal cavity. It's basically that one in-between. But then let's get into the abdominal wall. And you are going to have muscles of the anterior lateral abdominal wall, so kind of on the sides, on either side. And then you will have anterior abdominal wall muscles. And of the anterior lateral abdominal wall, you're going to have three, <coughs> excuse me, main muscles. And they go from superficial to deep, as the name would suggest. You have the external oblique muscle, which is going to be uh, the most superficial, also the largest, internal oblique will be the intermediate muscles. And then the transverse abdominis are going to be your deepest of the anterior lateral. And you can see those fibers are going very transversely, whereas the external and the internal obliques uh, kind of run in right angles to one another. And you can kind of think of these fibers um, of these different layers kind of being like the, the fibers you see in the plywood or something along those lines. And it really helps in terms of uh, giving the strength that you need in the anterior lateral abdominal wall. Now, usually when we think of the, um, the actions of the anterior lateral abdominal wall, uh, you think kind of that lateral flexion or like an oblique crunch kind of moving to the side. It has oblique right here in its name. And that certainly is the case. That is something that the anterior lateral abdominal wall muscles will do or play a role in. Um, and they also will play a role in terms of flexion of the trunk. But really one of its most important roles or 
is to really support and compress when needed the abdominal viscera so that deeper the deeper organs associated with the abdomen Now, all the tendons of those anterior lateral abdominal muscles are going to uh, spread out and kind of widen into an aponeurosis. And if you recall way back when we were talking about tendons, um, the kind of flat sheet-like tendons are referred to as aponeuroses. And that is exactly what you have going on here. Um, the tendons of all those oblique muscles are going to spread anteriorly and they will actually enclose the anterior abdominal muscle, the rectus abdominis. So you'll have two parts of the rectus sheath. You'll have the superficial part of the rectus sheath, which is what we're looking at right here. Um, if you reflect that, you would be looking at the rectus abdominis muscle. And then if you look deep to the rectus abdominis muscle, you would see the posterior portion of the rectus sheath. So it truly does envelop the rectus abdominis muscle. And kind of running right down the midline of, um, of the rectus sheath, you'll have this midline rafe or kind of collection of where all these tendons will coalesce and meet and are, is in, increasingly thick. And that's the linea alba. And this will extend all the way from the xiphoid process of the sternum all the way to the pubic symphysis, which is that anterior joint of the pelvic girdle. And then here you can see the rectus abdominis. So the superficial portion of the rectus sheath has been reflected here in order for you to be able to see the rectus abdominis. Its length is pretty similar in terms of, or pretty similar to the rectus sheath. So you're coming all the way from xiphoid process um, and costal cartilage is over here to the pubic symphysis region. <clears throat> this muscle will play a role in terms of flexion of a trunk. So if you think of a typical sit-up or a typical crunch, this rectus abdominis is uh, doing a lot of the contraction to allow, or a lot of that prime movement to allow for that. But similar to those anterior lateral abdominal muscles, it will play a role in terms of compressing that abdominal viscera. So a very important role there. Now, one thing you probably notice here are these tendinous intersections that are kind of seen throughout um, the span of the rectus abdominis, and they are exactly what they sound like. They're these little breakpoints of tendons. Usually you have three pairs, so you'd have one on this side here if the rectus sheath was um, reflected as well. And uh, these tendons, these tendinous intersections do not get larger, but the muscle around them can hypertrophy or get larger. And particularly if you're flexing um, that region or contracting this muscle, this can kind of bulge out from these tendinous intersections, giving that six pack look. Um, occasionally you can have another set of tendinous intersections for that eight pack look. So that is what's occurring here. These intersections don't get larger, but the muscles uh, can hypertrophy and get, um, particularly when flexed, you can see, uh, see those muscles in between those tendinous intersections. Okay, that was a lot of fun. So there is a lot of muscle and tendon associated with the abdomen, and they are very well organized to to get at the function of keeping the abdominal viscera where it needs to be and occasionally compressing it uh, when needed as well. And again, we didn't talk much about bone because we talked about the lumbar vertebrae when we were talking about the back and then, the, of course, the anterior abdominal wall. Not so much in terms of bone, right? So here is a nice question to review. And... Um, I want you to kind of think through these hiatuses or openings of the diaphragm. So which structure enters the thoracic cavity via the aortic hiatus of the diaphragm? Is it esophagus, the inferior vena cava, the phrenic nerve, the thoracic duct, or the vagus? And so I think key, the key here is it's entering the thoracic cavity 
and it's doing so via the aortic hiatus. So we know that the esophagus has its own hiatus, so that's not it. And the inferior vena cava has its own hiatus or opening, so that's not it either. The phrenic nerve is going to be what is innervating the diaphragm, so it is very much associated with the diaphragm, and it does send some small branches kind of inferior to the diaphragm, uh, but really it doesn't do so through any of these large hiatuses or openings, so that's not right. Ooh, thoracic duct, that's looking like a possibility because we know E, vagus nerve, is very closely associated to the esophagus, so it is traveling through that esophageal hiatus and not the aortic hiatus, so that is wrong as well. So the correct answer is thoracic duct, which travels through the aortic hiatus uh, with the descending aorta as well, and so that is the correct answer. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for your time and attention here. Please make sure to ask any questions early and often as you make your way through this material, and I hope you have a good rest of your day.